This letter was written on the 21st of September 1991 uh, because I was applying for a job as an art teacher at an art college and I wrote to several friends asking for help and this is the letter that I received from Ken. I believe it is still very relevant today, especially for the kind of freedom that it encourages to give students and at the same time it doesn't really detract from the kind of uh, rigid uh, academicism that is essential. I think it may be useful for young teachers that they begin to enter the world of teaching right now. And my very best of luck to them. Dear Eva, my feeling about the drawing business is that the student needs a way of working or perhaps a number of ways of working and each way of working will help him or her to sort out what he's doing. For example, if he's drawing something that he can actually see in front of him, there will be a lot of stuff going on and he will think or feel, how on earth can I draw that? If it's a human being, there are so many factors. The shape and proportions, the solidness, all the details and textures, the general appearance and feeling and balance and so on. If it is a landscape, so many bits of space, trees, buildings, whatever. How to do anything with it? Even if you try to cut all that out by getting them to draw something simple like an apple or a jack, although that can be good, there again, it can quickly become boring. In a way, the complexity is still too great with shape, solidness and so on. So, I would say, find simple approaches rather than simple subject matter. For example, say you do it all in little dots, squiggles or something. Then, if it works, the student is given a very simple approach, just simple dashes, but then finds himself feeling his way into space or around the solid form. Another example might be using shadow on a circle, doing that and then that, and then doing a drawing or say a shoulder or a blobby tree by overlapping lots of these shaded spheres. No need for cubes, etc. A circle will do it all. And you can modify it according to what you're looking at. Of course there is going to be a careful outline of something, just trying for an outline. That might be good with a pencil. But with charcoal, you might go for masses of light and shadow inside a room. Again, just the light and dark masses. The dots and squiggles thing is done at a high level by Van Gogh, Bonnard, Klee, etc. The shaded spheres in a Michelangelo drawing, etc., etc. You know all that. But I don't know if you would want to bring the great painters. With design-oriented students especially, perhaps it would be better to keep it really basic. Because after all, they might need to put it to very different uses. There are quite other approaches. I remember many years ago at secondary school doing some lessons using the idea of growing. We use watercolor, pencil, anything. And the idea was simply to suggest the idea of growing in any way. Not figuratively necessarily. You could blow the little pools of pain, for example. Things resulted like atoms multiplying or plants germinating or grass sprouting or some kind of cosmic explosion, all sorts of things. You can see how my mind works on this. If a student already has a way of drawing, then the question is whether it needs extending, whether it is inhibited and so on. If the student feels blank in the face of the problems of drawing, then a little group of ways of working seems to be a good idea. One way pushing into space and feeling round things, another a way of mapping out things, another a way of building things. Then other ways, like the growing idea, which are like playing, but which involve expressing or conveying something. I don't think measuring or perspective or copying in any way is bad, unless it is done in a rigid way or a way that suggests this is what you ought to do. 
If there is a group of approaches being taught, no one way is regarded as right. The design angle might be helpful. I think of the old film posters for the epics like Zulu, where perspective is used in the title, or mechanical things could be drawn, or man-made things like the hull of a boat. Fashion drawing usually distorts proportions of the figure. Then you look at what the proportions really are. I even remember drawing people at a bus stop to study the distances between them. The way, if there is no crash or just a few people, they give themselves a yard or more space, in England anyway. Sometimes I have found it helpful to be keen drawing something from inside. I mean inside the contours. Like drawing a face by starting at the cheekbone and working outwards. Using shading or scribbles, etc. I really don't believe that line work by itself can explore form. I think it can be very good if the student sometimes works on a drawing for a long time, say a whole day, if that is the time available. Because as you spend a long time on it, you pass through various phases. Of course, I'm not talking about the imbecility of the measured Chelsea and Slate type drawing, where they would fuss about for weeks. I mean getting really stuck in, like after an hour having the main masses and outlines and placing provisionally settled, then working into it, building up the forms and toughening everything as you go. After writing this, I had a talk with a friend who teaches evening classes and things. And she made the point that for her type of student, if they began with drawings that led to some students seeming to be skillful and others awkward, the awkward ones just became disheartened and the wrong attitude was built up. So she said she felt the thing to do was to try to get them interested and excited in ways where that didn't happen. For example, she mentioned a lesson she and someone else she knew did where the paper was divided up and in the first vertical row, tones were graded light to dark. Then she had played a tape with various kinds of music on it, say very soft, and then the student improvised sort of drew to the music across the top line, and so on, till in the bottom line they would be improvising to loud rock and roll or whatever. Another idea she mentioned was drawing pretty simple and roughly two things, and then the students being asked to rub them out, but that left a ghostly idea of where they had been, and draw them again strictly with the positioning inside the rectangle in mind, and perhaps rub out and redrawn again and again. This had the advantages of getting them not to be too precious, not to be frightened of rubbing out, of getting them to think, not just of imitating the objects, but of thinking of the whole rectangle and of treating the result as a whole, including the rub-out effect. She has also started them drawing by just getting them to do lines, any lines, not, not figurative, on the paper, then following that up by one with just patches. Also, issuing a video, any video, for example, an old black and white film, stopping it here and there, often at their suggestion and briefly drawing the result. I think all these are ideas worth thinking about, though whether you would want to put them in your essay, I don't know. She also mentioned sculptors working with her who did various things, but from the way she described them, I felt a little doubtful. I think there is a long history now in the art teaching of getting students to do things and then treating the result as art, even though the students themselves may be dissatisfied with it, because it doesn't really relate to them at all. I will get this letter off now. I will write another time, or we will discuss when you come over about printmaking and things. Hope things are going well for you and for your husband. Love from us all. Ken.